The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between an employee at a pet insurance company and a customer. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. Pet Protect UK, how can I help? Oh, hello there. I'm calling to inquire about your pet insurance plans. Of course. Just give me a second, please. Sure. So, have you checked our website already to see the options we offer? I've had a quick glance, and I think I'm interested in the basic plan. Great. I need to just ask a few questions first, then. Is your pet a dog, a cat, or a rabbit? It's a dog. And is it a puppy or...? No, he's three years old. Right. May I ask, has your dog been insured before? I just adopted him from the rescue centre last week, and I think he'd been there a while, so I doubt it. OK, so you've had him for a week then? That's correct. Great. I apologise for asking this, but your dog... What's his name, by the way? Fenton. Fenton. Is that spelt with an F? Yeah. F-E-N-T-O-N. -N. Great. Thank you for that. So, according to the Rescue Centre, has Fenton ever attacked, bitten, or been aggressive towards a person or another animal? No, not at all. Excellent. And is he a guide dog, or...? No, just a house pet. Great. And you said he's three years old. Do you know the exact date of birth? Oh, yes. It's on the adoption certificate. Just give me a sec. Um... It's May 19th, 2013. And do you know, has Fenton been neutered? Yes, he's been castrated. Excellent. And final question. What type of dog is Fenton? Is he a pedigree, a crossbreed or a mixed breed? A uh, crossbreed, I think. Right. A uh, crossbreed... Wait, sorry. What's the difference between the three? A pedigree is a dog whose parents are of the same breed... A crossbreed is from two different breeds, while a mixed breed is three or more. Then he's a mixed breed. Sorry about that. Right, no worries. So, could I take your full name, please? My name is Peter Pishinger. That's P-I-S-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. Right, thank you for that. And what's your address? That's 27 Cherry Drive, NW8 3HD. 3 H D and finally a telephone number please zero two zero three six three four seven nine five seven thank you you now have thirty seconds to look at questions seven to ten Now, you said you were interested in the basic plan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. May I ask, are you planning to switch insurance providers after the first year of your pet insurance, or is there a possibility you might renew with us? I haven't really thought about it. Why? The reason I'm asking is because if you plan to renew with us, it might be worth considering our premium or ultimate premium plan. With the basic plan, you will have to pay the same fee of £8 per month regardless of how long you stay with us. If you choose one of our other two plans, though, you will receive a discount for the first six months. You'll only have to pay £12 for premium and £15 for ultimate. And then, depending on your circumstances, you might be eligible for further discounts after your first year, depending on how many expenses you claim. 
If you claim less than £300, you'll have to pay the same as for the basic plan, but receive the cover provided by the premium plan. Huh. Is that something you might be interested in? I'll have to think about it. Is it possible to switch to one of the other plans later on? Yes, of course. You can always upgrade. Let's stick to the basic plan for now then, and then I might call you back to switch. No problem. So, what happens now? Well, first we would need you to come over with Little Fenton so we can have a look at his documents and medical history. We'd also need you to get him to the vet for a quick checkup. All of this is standard procedure before we can proceed with the insurance plan. And then, when all that's done, you can either set up a direct debit in person or you can call us back and do it over the phone. Right. And the basic plan will cover... Well, the basic plan covers veterinary fees, obviously, plus a few more things such as boarding costs, loss by theft or straying, advertising and reward, death by accident or illness. You can find a comprehensive list on our website, or I could forward it to you via email if you prefer. Thanks. I'll check the website. No problem. So, shall we book you an appointment so you can come over? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So... Five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20.
Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends. And I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps and convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then evening ones, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between three students who are preparing a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, Gail. You made it. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was stuck at the library paying late fees. Have you guys started going through the data yet? Yeah, we've already collated it and we've started designing the graphs we're going to use in the presentation. Oh, really? That's fast. Well, anyway, here's what we've got so far. OK, so... Wow, 38% said they thought about quitting school in the first year. That's a huge number. Yeah, and only 10% said they were happy at school from beginning to end. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I thought the majority would be happy here. Well, just remember that about 30% of the school population are foreign students. And from the UK students, only 2% are actually from the area. So, I guess it makes sense that people would miss home. Yeah, but to want to actually quit school. Well, they didn't want to exactly, they just thought about it. OK, so how should we organise the presentation? What did you guys decide? Well, 
Kevin and I were saying that we should start by explaining what the topic of our research was and how we decided to collect the data. So, I'll start by saying that our topic was how first-year students felt a month after beginning school and how their attitudes progressed and changed by the end of the academic year. So then we were thinking that I should explain that the population we want to study was obviously first-year students, but because we need their complete experience from the beginning to the end of their first year, we'd have to actually poll students in their second and third year. And then we said that you should explain how we access the population. So I'll say that we got the permission from the school to go to different classes from different departments and hand out the surveys in paper form, right? Right and that it took us about three weeks to complete this part of our research. So then we need to describe the three different areas of focus of our survey, so Lindsay can do that. Uh, say that the survey had three sections, the first one asking just some general questions about the age, gender, nationality and field of study of each student, then the second one focused on how they felt in their first six months at school, and the third how they felt in the summer after their first year was complete. That sounds good. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 26 to 30. OK, so let me see the breakdown. Uh, OK, so we've got an equal distribution of boys and girls. That's good. Almost equal. 51% of the participants were boys. The rest were girls. Right, and 70% of the participants were British, while the other 30% were... 10% were from America and Asia, 2% were from Africa, and 18% were European. We had a small number of Australians as well, 0.03%, so I guess Europeans were 17.97% if you want to be precise. Which we should. Anyway, and obviously the age was all 20 or 21, with a few 19-year-olds. Only about 5%. No, wait, 4%, right? No, it's 5%, look. Right, OK. So Lindsay will describe the three sections, and then you, Kevin, you'll describe the demographic and geographical breakdown, and I... Uh, you can start with the graph, and then we'll all explain the data together. Right. So we'll put this graph up on the board and explain that most students experience some form of homesickness or mild depression in the beginning of their course. But we need to point out that by the end of the year, it was only 5% that still felt like quitting school. Yeah, but remember that we didn't actually have the opportunity to interview or poll any of the students who left school, so the information we have only relates to current students, and those numbers might be bigger in reality. Yeah, I guess we need to mention that. But we did check the dropout rate for the last two years, and it was very low, so at the end of the day, the numbers can't be much bigger. Yeah. Anyway, so after we explain the data and we show the three graphs with the background information and the responses for six months and one year, we should spend some time also talking about... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a biology lecture about tubularia. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello, everyone. I'm glad so many people have shown up here today to hear about these fascinating little creatures called the Turbillaria. My name is Dr. Baker, and I've spent 20 years researching thousands of different species of platyhelminths, what are commonly known as flatworms, both free-living and parasitic. So there are a lot of things I could tell you about these extremely interesting invertebrate, but I will try to keep it short. Turbillaria are unique amongst flatworms in three ways. The first one is that unlike 80% of all platyhelminths, turbillaria do not need to secure nourishment from a living source. This means that they do not generally parasitize a host, but are instead found living freely in the environment. So, no need to worry about any of these little samples I've got here escaping and causing havoc. The second way in which they're different is that they are, well, they're incredibly simple. And by simple, I don't mean in terms of structure, as their structure is indeed quite complex, and I'll get to that later. By simple, I mean that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Flatworms in general are not known for their cognitive abilities especially when compared with other invertebrates such as cuttlefish or octopuses or even insects. But amongst flatworms, turbillaria are by far the most primitive of the bunch. Finally, and this is a direct result of the first thing I mentioned, turbillaria tend to have a much more complicated sensory system in their head region. This includes a set of eyes with receptors that can detect light, as well as chemical sensory organs that assist turbillaria in locating food. Obviously, as other flatworms receive nutrition directly from their host, they have no need for this. Despite these three differences, however, turbillaria are quite similar to other flatworms in all sorts of other ways. First of all, as their name suggests, they're incredibly flat, which allows them to hide under stones. They're symmetrical on both sides, and they don't have a body cavity. They also don't have any specialized respiratory, skeletal, and circulatory systems. What they do have, however, and this is what I meant when I referenced their structure before, is three layers known as the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, as well as a head region where their brain and sense organs are located, and a spongy connective tissue that fills all the space between their organs. Finally, like most species of flatworms, they're hermaphrodites, this means that a single flatworm has a set of each gender. But don't take this to mean they reproduce alone. Their preferred method of reproduction is called cross-fertilization, which means that each flatworm fertilizes the other. I mentioned before that most flatworms need a host, but turbillaria feed from the environment. So what do they feed on? Most turbillaria can be found either in fresh or salt water and they feed on small insects, microscopic matter, and crustaceans. They will pretty much eat anything they find. They have no preference on whether their food is living or dead. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, if they ever find themselves in a situation where food is scarce, they might also feed on themselves. That's right. They'll start eating their own body, starting with the least essential muscles and organs and working their way up. They will shrink in size until they're able to find food again, at which point they'll begin to regenerate everything they've lost. One final thing about food, and apologies in advance if I disgust you, turbillaria don't possess an anus, which means that their mouth, which is a muscular opening on the underside of their body, has to serve as one. Before I finish this presentation, one more thing you've probably heard before but weren't sure if it was a myth or not. I mentioned already that turbillaria can reproduce on their own, 
But there's a second method they can use, which is known as fission. Now, as a child, you were probably told that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two new worms. That's not entirely true, but flatworms are not worms exactly, and they do have the ability to regenerate by splitting into two, perhaps even more smaller parts, at which point each part regrows the missing organs and becomes a brand new turbellarian. Now this is extremely important for us, and this is how I'd like to close this presentation, because their ability to regenerate endlessly makes them virtually immortal, and it might open pathways to regeneration in human cells or slowing the human aging process, which is why scientists like myself have been studying these unique creatures, hoping to get some answers. Thank you for listening, and please come along to see me and my samples if you have any further questions. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.